realized I was codependent and I started doing the research, that's when I knew I had to write a book about codependency. Thank my experience with him for teaching me what I needed, needed to learn, which is ultimately to let go. Today, we're going to be talking about the number one step that you can take that will help you win after narcissistic abuse. If you love this content, don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notification bell. This way, every time I upload a new video, you will be the first to know. So if you have found yourself in a narcissistic relationship, then you know what it feels like to be caught up in a tornado. You know, narcissistic relationships are very similar to tornadoes. They sweep us off our feet. We get caught up in these whirlwinds. We often don't know where we are. We often don't know which way is up. When you are involved with a narcissist, you are idealized in the beginning generally. You are often love bombed. You can be pulled in by a sob story, by someone who is willing to and wants to emotionally exploit you. They want your attention. They want you to cater to them. They want to know that when they say something, you're going to drop everything and be there for them. It matters not if it is the entire truth or distortion of the truth. This can be very um, destabilizing when you realize that you have been lied to, that you have been exploited, that your emotions have been toyed with. When you are in the middle of a tornado, you really can't tell, you know, what is the the top and what's the bottom. And that's what it can feel like when you're in the middle of a toxic relationship. Nothing makes sense. You know, narcissists struggle with uh, what they know as cognitive distortions. And so what a cognitive distortion is that basically imagine if you are someone who feels entitled to be seen as more important than someone else. And you feel entitled then to gain this person's praise or their admiration or their sympathy or their pity. And you tell someone a part of your story, but you don't tell the whole story. There is a cognitive distortion that takes place that allows someone who has high narcissistic traits or cluster B type personality traits, who then is able to rationalize lying to you or rationalizing, they will be able to rationalize abusing you because of their cognitive distortions. So they rationalize poor behavior and that's what makes it okay for them to be who they are in their mind. And remember, it's narcissists are very self-focused and research tells us that many narcissists struggle with tremendous trauma and many narcissists don't know that they're narcissists. And there are also research studies that are suggesting that there are people in society who know that they are narcissistic and they confuse this narcissistic arrogance with self-confidence and self-esteem. We know that there are adults who have been treated with this sense of entitlement by their parents. So they were raised by entitled parents. They were raised by people who told them that they should go out there and they should step on the heads of other people. It's good to take advantage of other people as long as you get ahead. And so it's important that we understand that this idea of being grandiose when it comes to a preoccupation with oneself can be rooted in various causes. I think for uh, the reasons that I create sessions like this is really to help someone who has found themselves in the middle of a narcissistic relationship and specifically who may, like myself, may have struggled with codependency, really win after this type of a relationship to discover that you really can end up on the top, that you really can end up having a transformation of consciousness. You really can come out better than you went in. And in lots of the cases, I can say this with complete confidence as a life coach and as someone who assists people in an online coaching program, I can tell you that many people discover that 
these types of relationships broke them open so wide that they were forced to go within. When you are in a narcissistic relationship, you have these splintered aspects of yourself that the narcissist has exploited for their own gain. When you are codependent, you have been raised to believe that you should not be in touch with the self. When you are codependent, you are other focused. So in this concept, you can see that someone with high codependency would be an ideal match for someone with high narcissistic traits who is self-focused. When you think about the codependent narcissistic relationship, we have a codependent who is other focused and lacks a healthy sense of self or lacks a concept of self. That's sad. I know that that was my situation. I did not have a sense of self and worse, I didn't know it. I thought because I was walking and talking and I was animated and breathing and eating and doing what I saw other human beings do, I thought that I was alive. And what I realized now was I was a sheep. Yeah, I was a sheep. And I'm not saying that incorrectly. Yes, I was asleep, but I was a sheep. I was in a trance-like state, living out childhood programming, attracting and manifesting people into my life that mirrored the people in my childhood and I didn't even know it. So I was an actor in a play and I was unconscious to the idea that I was in a play. The illusion was I was awake when I wasn't. And that was a mind bending experience, but, and an earth shattering experience, but an experience that led to my breakdown, which led to my breakthrough. And this is the way it is for many of us. Many of us discover that when we are having these breakdowns, when we are having these terribly painful experiences, something in lots of the cases, something divine is happening. The outer shell is being removed. The illusion is being shattered. And we discover parts of ourselves that we didn't even know existed that would have never been able to surface had we not had these breakdown type experiences. I know with me, when I needed to confront my codependency and I realized what a mess my life was in and I understood that I had a hand in it, a subconscious hand in it, but a hand in it nonetheless, it was very difficult to face. It was like eating humble pie for like, felt like years but I had to recognize that I had the ability to change my life, but it wasn't going to be easy. It was like being in the eye of a tornado and single-handedly through your own energy source, moving the direction of the wind counterclockwise. That's what it felt like. And when my parents turned away from me, when my brother and my sister didn't understand the reason I wanted to get a divorce when my in-laws were flabbergasted, when my ex-husband was like irate, the how dare I decide that I want to end this marriage. It was a breakdown for sure. It was everything that I knew and I loved was fading away. But I think that that was the most important step. And that's what allowed me to win after narcissistic abuse that moment when I realized, oh, this is what's wrong. I'm codependent. My ex-husband is highly dependent upon me and I am dependent upon him. So I am looking to please him. I anticipate his needs and he expects me to. So neither one of us was happy, but if we were going to label the traits I was becoming a very active codependent, very irritated by the end, by the end of my marriage. And my ex-husband was someone who felt entitled to exploit me emotionally because he believed or wanted me to believe that I owed him. 
that he was superior to me. He was more spiritual than me. He was more religious than me. He was better than me. His needs and his perceptions were correct and mine were incorrect. So he was valid and I was invalid. And for many years, I believed him. For many years, I battled within myself. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, why can't you just see things the way he sees things? You know, there has to be something wrong with you. And it was this thrashing about within my own skin, within my own heart, and within my own mind, feeling like something was wrong, but I was unable to identify what was wrong. And it wasn't until I was falling apart, literally falling apart, and after a number of therapists finally happened to find a psychotherapist who was very skilled in codependency and during our first meeting said, what's wrong is that you're codependent and to fix it, it's going to take everything you've got, essentially were, was his message and boy was he correct. So to win after a narcissistic relationship means that you have to first identify what's wrong. You bring your car into a mechanic. The first thing that they do is they ask you, well, what do you hear? What does it feel like? What's going on? They're asking you to identify what's wrong. When you leave the car there, they look under the hood. Again, they're looking for what's wrong. Why? Because they know that if they can find the problem, then they can fix it. When you are in a relationship with a narcissist or someone who is completely below the veil, someone who lacks the ability to look within, someone who is not looking for self-knowledge, someone who has an inability to take responsibility for how they feel, for how they make other people feel, for what they put people through, Someone who is unable to look within is not someone who's going to look under his her, or her own hood. That means they're not looking for the problem. Within, that means, guess what? You will always be the problem. Now, I hope you have your ears on. Here's the problem. When you are codependent and you are other focused, you think the problem is you. So you don't even feel like you have the ability or the right or the permission to think outside of that context. So you're looking for permission to feel what you feel. So you don't look under your own hood the right way. When you look under your hood, you think and you believe that you must be the problem. When you are codependent, oftentimes you come from a very neglectful home, emotionally neglectful. You could have been the kid in the big house on the corner with a swimming pool in the backyard who had piano lessons and had the braces and the glasses and had maybe even had a little pony. You could have been that kid, but you could have also grown up feeling very distant, very um, detached from your mom, very detached from your dad. You could have grown up feeling like an obligation or like you really weren't loved. You really weren't wanted. You were just there. And this affects your perception of self. When we come into this world, it is up to our mothers and fathers to make us feel seen. And when that doesn't happen, there is a giant empty hole inside of us. And because we are not conditioned, we're not educated about the self, what we do is we set ourselves out upon the road on a quest to feel good enough. And what does is, what is a codependent do? Because a codependent feels like they're not good enough. We feel like we are dysfunctional. This is the best it's gonna get. We don't know why we're not worthy, but we just know that we're not worthy. We look for people to take care of because we think that we have to prove ourselves worthy of love. We've learned to believe that love is contractual. So my father takes care of my mother out of obligation or my father is, is elderly and he's married a younger, more beautiful woman and love is contractual. It's not about love, it's not about connection, it's a contract. Or 
there are so many different reasons or mom may have uh, maybe down and out on her luck and she marries an alcoholic who has a job and health insurance. So love is contractual. It's not about a connection. It's not about a we. It's about egos. It's about fear. It's about dominance. It's about making sure that your basic needs are met. But again, it's contractual. You may have grown up in a home where children were seen and not heard. You may have grown up hearing things like, if you want to cry, come over here. I'll give you something to cry about. You may have grown up feeling like what you felt was irrelevant. So you were emotionally neglected. Perhaps your parents gaslight, gaslit you. Perhaps they lied to you. Perhaps they compared you to other children. I've heard stories where when one child has died, parents have said to the surviving child, oh, the wrong daughter died or the wrong son died. This is abusive. This is um, a disgusting way to, to speak to a child that's also grieving the loss of their sibling. But this happens, and I've heard this story more than once. And so when we're dealing with parents who are narcissistic, it's about them. It's not about the child. And children can end up feeling extremely untrusting. So they distrust the parents, and rightfully so. But this leaves a scar because in order for us to really be social and in order for us to have loving relationships that fulfill our lives and make us feel like life is worth living, it's difficult then if the people who brought you into this world are people who you can't trust and your brain is doing the right thing. You know, you can't trust certain people. And so it makes you being able to let down your guard and let people in much more difficult. As a caveat to that, my solution to that was learning to trust myself. So when I meet people, I trust how I feel about them. And that took a long time. That took decades to be able to master. And I still get wobbly from time to time. But every time something happens in my life, I end up hearing the lesson over and over. You should have trusted yourself. You had a doubt about that person. There was something about he, what he said or how she said it that made you go, hmm, and you ignored it. And so the lesson for me over and over is trust your gut. And so as I trust my gut, then I don't have to worry so much about trusting other people because if someone proves to be untrustworthy, then I've learned that that has to do with them, not me. So as long as I've learned to trust myself, I'll be okay. And you're no different than I am in the sense that our journeys are the same. We have to recover from these parts of ourselves that have been splintered off in childhood through negative childhood experiences or adverse childhood experiences. Experiences that have made us afraid to really be the self or be with the self. Experiences that have caused us to have terrible memories of things that happened to us that were not our fault. We need to integrate those aspects of ourselves that have caused us to think that we're unworthy. So we have to reclaim these parts of ourselves. And that's really difficult because when you are codependent, you are other focused. So you think that the answer is in gaining the love and the acceptance and the validation of people outside of you. And as long as you keep living that way, you will be disappointed because you're putting your sense of power and your sense of trust in things that you can't control in entities outside of you that are just as human as you are. And humans have the ability to hurt one another. We all know this. And so if you love someone who then betrays you, how do you feel if you think that you needed this person? You feel devastated. It might take you a very long time to recover. You might never recover, right? And so the goal really is to be able to integrate those lost parts of ourselves, be able to love ourselves in spite of never being loved, to reclaim these aspects of ourselves so that when people disappoint us, we are not devastated to the point where we can't move forward. 
You have to love yourself. When you're looking to heal from a narcissistic relationship, the most important thing to do, step one, is to recognize what's wrong. You want to look under the hood. You want to understand the relationship dynamics. And yes, if you are a codependent and you have been plagued by this feeling like you're not good enough, you've never been good enough. If you are the person who always thinks it's you, you are the one that's wrong all the time. So how does this show up? This shows up when you say you're sorry when someone bumps into you at the grocery store. Oh, I'm sorry. This shows up when people say, what do you want to do tonight? And you say, uh, whatever you want to do. This shows up when you go to a party and you're the first one to clean the table and you are the last one to leave, right? So you're very conscientious about the other people. Now you'll look, you'll look around the room and you'll see that other people are enjoying their drinks or they're enjoying conversation, but you are so far removed from enjoying the moment because you have been taught that you're not good enough. So you think that you have to jump around like a rabbit to be good enough. You have to prove to other people that you're worthy of being at that party or you're worthy of having this experience. And so you can find yourself acquiescing and people pleasing. Lots of times this is rooted in this idea that I'm not good enough and I need to prove to you that I, that I am good enough. And I, you know, when I started recognizing that type of behavior in myself, I was annoyed at myself. I was just so annoyed that I behaved this way, that I was looking for um, people to give me the sense that they thought that I was good enough to hang out with them. So I was the person that was always cleaning up, making sure that the hostess knew that I was good enough to be there. And deeper, I was looking for a sense of validation, a sense of acceptance. And deeper, I didn't even think that I belonged, belonged there. You know, and so doing for other people made me feel like, okay, yeah, I, I belong here because I just scrubbed every pot in the house, even the ones that were clean. You know, I must be willing to be here. That's how deep codependency can go when you don't feel like you're good enough. Now, I'll say it again. When you're in a codependent narcissistic relationship, you have to see this clearly. A narcissist will always think that you're the wrong one. So they're not looking under their own hood. If you are codependent, you're looking under your hood and you think it's always you. So it's two people in one relationship and one person's always wrong. Think about that. That's not even realistic, right? In every relationship that we have, there are going to be times where you're right and your partner's wrong and vice versa because we're all flawed. We're, we all have an amygdala. We all have a limbic system. We all have triggers. We all have emotions. We can all be reactive. So there are going to be times when both parties need to say, I'm sorry. And when another caveat, when you say you're sorry, there should be no and, but, or because. When people say, I'm sorry, but that's not an apology or I'm sorry, but I did that because not an apology. An apology means that I recognize that there's something that I said, something that I did, something that I didn't say, maybe the way that I said it hurt you. And I'm sorry. Saying I'm sorry and meaning it is like an art form. It's like dancing. It's like fine crystal. It's not easy to perfect. And the more you transcend your own ego and the more you love yourself and you accept that you're not perfect and you're going to make mistakes and that's okay because you know that you're here to learn and you're here to evolve, the better you get at saying, I'm sorry. And that's a beautiful thing. Now, when you're dealing with someone who has high narcissistic traits, they're not very good at saying, I'm sorry. In fact, they suck at it. They, they don't say, I'm sorry. And if they say they're sorry, it's like this haphazard sorry, just to get you to shut up. They don't mean it. You know, in my experience with my ex-husband, he would say one thing on Monday and then on Friday, say a completely different thing. And then when I or the kids were devastated that he lied, he would have haphazard, well, I would have said anything to shut you and the kids up. Like no, no, no depth, no understanding that, you know, that there was a lie and 
now we're hurt because you lied and now we're hurt because you don't care that you lied. Like there's no, there's no depth. There's no understanding. There's no empathy for, for the, the, the betrayal. There's no empathy for how that destroys your, your one's ability to trust you. There's just no understanding of it, which is really sad. But when you're in this type of a relationship, it's really important to understand the main problem. One of the main problems, and I think step one is to recognizing, recognizing this dynamic that when you are in a relationship with someone who is highly narcissistic, they are not looking under their hood. They're looking under your hood. You will always be the wrong one. And if you are highly codependent, then you already entered the relationship thinking that you were the wrong one. That's what codependency is about. When you're codependent, you don't feel good enough. So you develop these behaviors to mask this feeling of emptiness. That could be people pleasing. That could be enabling. That could be acquiescing. That could be fixing and taking care of people to the point where they end up depending upon you on you. And this is very common when we see relationships between a codependent and someone who is struggling with alcoholism. Studies have proven that there are similar traits between people who tend to be spouses of alcoholics. And based on research, we've noticed that when alcoholics get sober, sometimes the codependent partner get wobbly. They lose their, who am I? I am this person's partner. I take care of them. I am the one who caters to them. I'm the one who lies to the children. I'm the one who lies to the boss. You know, I'm the one that feels bad because I am married to an alcoholic. That's my identity. And it can be really difficult to help someone pry their fingers off of that identity and help them rediscover an entirely new paradigm for themselves, which sounds something like I am enough. I don't need to cater. I don't need to enable. That's not love. Codependents confuse, confuse rescuing and people pleasing and acquiescing and lying for their partners for love. So if I attract a very troubled partner and I'm the more codependent one, I am lying for my partner who has just robbed a bank. I am lying for my partner who once again is doing drugs in the bathroom and that's why he couldn't go to work. Or I am lying for my best friend when I know that she's drunk in the bedroom and her children want to know where she is. I am confusing enabling with love. Well, I'm a good friend. So shouldn't I lie for my friends who are acting irresponsibly? No, you shouldn't lie for anyone, but codependents tend to lie and cover up for people who are experiencing or involving or engaging themselves in poor behavior. Now, why would someone who is struggling with low self-worth, low self-esteem, lacking a sense of selfhood, why would someone lie for someone that they cared about? Well, a couple of reasons. They confuse loyalty with this irresponsible enabling. So they confuse enabling with loyalty. So if I'm loyal to someone, then I lie for them. Even if I'm lying to the people who love them, and even if I'm lying and I know that my friend is engaging in irresponsible behavior, I am giving my best friend my car, even though she crashed up her mother's car while drinking, I'll just give her my car because I'm loyal to her. That's enabling and that's codependency. So when you are enabling someone's poor behavior and it is tied to the inability or the fumbling or the clumsiness when it comes to setting boundaries because you don't know how to set a boundary or because you don't know how you feel, you don't stop long enough to ask yourself, well, how do I feel about my best friend's alcohol addiction? And how do I feel about my best friend drinking and driving and stealing her mom's car? and then coming here after the accident and wanting my car. How do I feel about this experience? 
often when we are codependent, we don't hit the pause button long enough to worry about the self. How do you worry about a self you don't have? That's always been the question or those types of questions that keep me up at night. How do we as people set boundaries if we don't have a self or we have been raised to think that the self that we are is insignificant? If we have been raised by people who were dysfunctional, emotionally immature, who raised us to worry more about their needs than our own needs, how then do we develop a healthy sense of self? And without a healthy sense of self, you cannot set a boundary because in order to set a boundary, you have to know what you think. You have to know what you feel. You have to know what you need. You have to know what you believe. When you are codependent, you have been conditioned to worry about other people. You're not in your own skin. You slip right into the skin of other people and you become their problem solver. That's a problem. To win after a narcissistically abusive relationship, the first step is to recognize the problem. If you are unhappy, that's a problem. If you are in a relationship that feels toxic, that's a problem. If you are in a relationship with someone who berates you and who gaslights you, who blame shifts, who projects, who minimizes and devalues you, that's a problem. If you are in a relationship with someone who is exploiting your kindness and your empathy, that's a problem. So step one is identifying these problems. When we are codependent, we tend to stay in relationships and we don't set boundaries. We don't have a sense of self. We're being confused by the, our partners. We are told that we are the problem and we believe it. And so we fill with shame. And then when we look within, we don't have the life skills necessary to hit the pause button. We just don't know how to do it. And the reality is, that's not your fault. When I looked within for how to deal with my emotions, I didn't have a hammer. I didn't have a shovel. I didn't have any tools. My parents didn't do emotions. They didn't do them well. I saw a bunch of repression. I saw anger. That's what I saw. I saw now looking back, I under understand that I also saw a lot of passive aggressiveness. I saw a lot of rage. I saw a lot of pretending, making believe that my parents didn't feel the, what, they, what they felt. There was no one teaching me how to deal with negative emotions. There was just this idea that if I felt a negative emotion, I was wrong. I was a drama queen. I was a bad girl. I was a liar if I said I was unhappy. Try to figure that one out. But when I had an emotion and expressed it, I was labeled. And yet we're all emotional human beings. When I was in college in psychology class, my father would routinely say, don't believe that psychological mumbo jumbo. It's all a bunch of nonsense. And I looked, I would look at him like side eyed, like, I don't know if that makes sense. So, you know, I'm being trained by, you know, a doctor who has a PhD in psychology and nothing against you, dad, but you quit high school, you know, like, it didn't even make sense to me that my father was telling me to not listen to the teachers and the mentors, but my dad had high narcissistic traits and he thought he was the smartest person in the world. And so, you know, taking a cue from a psychology teacher was not something that my father was going to do easily. He had to discredit people. He had to uh, minimize other people who threatened his ideas of the world. And that's what narcissists do. They don't do it many times. They're not doing it consciously. It's just what they do. And the more codependent we are, the more we accept that as the norm. The less codependent we are, the more we are suspicious when people are needing to minimize what other people say. The more suspicious we are or the more discerning we are when we hear people say certain things or gaslight ourselves or other people or blame shift, the more discerning we are, 
the less codependent we are. And so I hope that what you're gaining from this session is this idea that when you are in the throes of a narcissistic relationship, it feels very much like a tornado. You can't tell which way is up. And one of the main agendas of a narcissist is to keep the focus on you when it comes to who's the wrong one, who's the knucklehead in the relationship, who's the dope, who's the one that's silly and frivolous, who is the one that's losing their mind, who is the one that cannot be trusted. It's not going to be them. And it's always going to be you. When you recognize this is a pattern in that moment, you get to step back. That is a huge step on the recovery journey. When you're recognizing that, oh, the relationship dynamics are wrong. Many of us get caught up wanting to know. I get this question all the time in my 12 week breakthrough coaching program, in my Facebook pages that we run through the program is how do I know that my partner is a narcissist? It's almost like people want a definitive, uh, a definitive answer. And I always ask like, why is that important to you? that you know whether or not this person is a narcissist. And usually after some back and forth between me and my life coaches and the client or the student in the class, we come to a, a place where people are feeling like they can't trust how they feel. And if someone tells them, oh yes, your husband or your wife is a narcissist or your daughter or your, your son is a narcissist, it's like, oh, we give them permission to say, oh, I can leave this relationship. And that's a problem because what we want to do as individuals is get to a point where we trust our own selves, where whether or not this person is a narcissist is not as important as it is how we feel in the relationship. That has to be our new barometer. How do I feel? Do I feel seen? Do I feel heard? Do I feel nurtured? Do I feel safe? Am I a good partner to my partner? Does my partner feel seen? Do I have the desire to hear my partner? And so this becomes a new barometer. But when you are in a narcissistic relationship, your ability to make decisions is definitely affected because you have been conditioned to believe that everything that is wrong is you. So you don't trust yourself. So it's very common to come to YouTube or to read books or to walk into a therapist's office and to look for a definitive answer. And that's why I think it's important to talk about what is wrong in terms of relationship dynamics. And so if you notice that you are in a relationship where you feel confused all the time, you do not feel supported, you do not feel loved, you do not feel heard, you feel taken advantage of, you believe that you're being lied to. If you are in a relationship where you are always mocked, there is a pervasive pattern of gaslighting, of projection, and you feel, like I said, you feel unsafe. This is something that you have to recognize as being problematic. From there, you have to look at, wait a minute, if this is the nature of my relationship and the nature of my relationship is a problem, now in that space, you can ask yourself in this space between the two of us, am I the one who is continually saying, I'm sorry. Am I the one who is always looking to solve the problem and be the peacemaker in the experience between the two of us? Does my partner refuse to accept any responsibility? And does my partner continue to blame me for everything? for absolutely everything. And of course, when you are asking yourself these, these questions, you first and foremost must be fair with yourself. So I don't think it's fair to want something from someone that you're not willing to give. So make sure that you are being fair minded when you look at this. And as you observe the relationship dynamics, you know that you are not the one constantly blaming your partner. You are not the one who blame shifts. You are not the one who's projecting. So if you are codependent, you want to clearly be able to define how you show up as feeling less than as feeling like the one who is rescuing, enabling, lying for your partner. And you are the one who is other focused and your partner is more 
self-focused and in this relationship dynamic, you are the one who is continually told that you are wrong. And you are the one who looks under your hood consistently and feels wrong and is consistently trying to turn themselves into a pretzel to try to figure out how to make this person happy. Once you identify this, that is the most important part of this recovery journey, in my humble opinion, because it is the first step in identifying the nature of the dysfunctional relationship. And from there, you, you throw yourself into self-knowledge. You learn everything you can about narcissism and codependency. And all you can do is take responsibility for your side of the plate. You cannot take responsibility for the other person. And I think one of the most difficult things that you'll, you'll notice is that you're going to need to learn how to say no. You're going to learn to stop seeking validation. You're going to have to learn how to stop seeking permission. And you are going to learn how to set boundaries. And as you do, this begins to um, free you up in order to generate your own love and you fill up your own love tank, as John Bradshaw says. And before long, you are able to walk out into the world with a heart full of self-love because you finally understood that you've been giving yourself to an energy vampire, sort of like a Dracula, who needs blood to survive. And you are no longer doing that, so you've stopped your own bleeding. And now you can fill your own heart up with love and now from that space, you can begin manifesting relationships that mirror the love that you are because darling, dear one, you are enough. And I would like to bow to the love and the light that is absolutely within you. Bye for now. Hey, if you love this content, don't forget to check out the next video and you can go to my website and take the codependency quiz.